And I'd like to use this occasion to share with you about what are the challenges of agriculture and rural development, I perceive. In effect, we may discuss a lot in the you know, one day and a half. And what kind of policy framework can be used to cope with those kind of challenges? And as well as my perception of the role of the World Bank in this process. In terms of the challenge of rural and agricultural development, I'd like to summarize in five areas. The first one, put in mind. The second one, poverty reduction. The third one, rural urban transformation. The fourth one, the disparity between rural and urban. And the last one is the challenges of climate change. Well, I think that the war is facing increasing demand for food. I think that everyone knows because the population of the world continues to grow. Currently, we have 6.8 billion population. And according to the forecast, by the time of 2030, 20 years from now, the world population will increase another 20%, up to 8.2 billion. And then, another 20 years, 2050s, the world population might reach 9.3 billion. That will aid another 13%. And with this kind of increase in population, certainly we need to produce more food, feed them. But that already so, because income is increasing, right? Luckily, we made some contribution to the whole food. And with income increase, by the chance, people eat more meat and you need to use food to come, come, convert to, 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 to meat. And, uh, and also, as a side effect of the economic development, the resources is reducing depletion. And there's a need to use biofuel you know, as a substitute. And for that, there are also competition for food and fuel. So all this means that the challenges of producing more Grain, more agricultural product, is a real challenge. In the long run, we know productivity increase is essential because land and waters are limited. Unless we increase productivity, otherwise we cannot meet this demand. And we also know that trade may help because with trade, then we can, you know has some kind of specialization and uh, allow areas that are favorable for production, agricultural product to produce more. And uh, for some you know, land limited or water limited country can use trade as a way to you know, gain more access to land and to waters. We don't want to be known. But in the short run, agriculture is subject to the impact of nature. So volatility will always be there. And with volatility, we know price will increase, will fluctuate. We also know that if trade is not free, the government try to intervene in the trade, then the price fluctuation will be even bigger. And we know the price fluctuation, the poor people in general, uh, the group of people which are hurt most. And under that, we know there are some kind of needs of statistical stocking, grain reserve, at the national level. And then maybe we also need to find some kind of innovative way in the international level. That is one challenge. The second challenge is I can see we discussed a lot this morning and also yesterday. That is the rural development, agricultural development, and the poverty reduction. Currently, 75% of poor people live in rural areas, their own agriculture. And for that, empirical evidence strongly supports that. Agricultural growth is a very important vehicle for poverty reduction. Rural development, including migration, contributed more than 50% of the poverty reduction in the past two or three decades. But in a globalized world, to use agricultural growth to promote the poverty reduction, we also need to improve the market. So the agricultural production with the productivity increase 
can reach the domestic market and international market. And for that, its effect on poverty reduction will be biggest. But if we link the domestic market with the international market, we also know. But change in the international market will also have a feedback on the issue of poverty in rural areas and also in urban areas of individual countries. So that's the second challenge. How to facilitate that, benefit from that, and reduce the, the, the risk. And the third one is the urbanization and the economic structural transformation. Certainly, in the poor country, low-income country, agricultural employee, the majority of the labor force and with the majority of the population. But for continuous income growth, <coughs> To move from the low-income status to middle-income to high-income status, agriculture is a declining sector, which cannot be reversed. And from the statistical data we know, in the terms of high-income country currently, low-income country currently, about 70% of the population are in agriculture in rural areas. <coughs> and move to the Low middle income country, on the average, about 55% of the population. In a higher middle income country, the population in rural sectors is about 35%. High income country, only about 22%. But in terms of employment, it's even dramatic, more dramatic. <coughs> Low income country, on the average, they employ about close to 70% of labor force in agricultural sectors. And when you move to the Low middle income country, on the average, they only employ about 37% of the labor force. And then move the data up to the higher middle income country, about 18%, less than 20%. Then reach the status of high income country, they only employ about less than 10%, only about, on the average, about 6%. And value added of agriculture, we know that low income country, on the average, Agriculture contributed about one third of their national GDP, gross GDP. And they reached the low middle income country, about 15%. And then high middle income country, only about 8%. And they reached the high income country, that is only less than 5%, only average about 4%. So agriculture is important. But for a country to continue Find the latest up to the mid-income, high-income country. We need to facilitate this kind of structural transformation. And that is the third challenge. First challenge is that, I think it's a core of the second, the third challenge, that is the rural urban disparities. Certainly when we treat agriculture as the core for development, we will have a lot of effort to, to improve the productivity and so on. But the urban non-agricultural sectors, the productivity increase will be even faster. So under this kind of situation, you are going to see some kind of income disparity between urban and rural sectors. And on the one hand, it's necessary because only by that, it provides incentive for all migration or labor force from agriculture to non-agriculture. But on the other hand, this disparity can become a social tension. That's one thing. And uh, we need to address the social tension. Otherwise, it may cause social instabilities and uh, make development in principle. But I'd like to say, the disparity is not only in income. If you look into the world, the disparity also exists in social sectors. For example, education, health, and so on. And those kind of disparity will make the service disparity will make the income disparity become perpetuated because you know labor force were children grew up in rural areas if they do not receive similar education in quality or in health it will reduce their ability to compete in non agricultural sectors and make this kind of disparity perpetuated so that is another challenge and the last one certainly we know the climate changes is something real, and with the climate changes, the volatility in the output will increase, and the price 
structurally, but volatility will become quickest and that will hurt the poor country, the poor people. And because of the climate changes research show, to meet the demand of food grain, the productivity needs to increase even more further. Otherwise, we will not be able to cope with these kind of challenges. I think those are the five areas of challenge I perceive. I think that we all know that. I just summarize that. Okay. But we need to have our strategies to cope with these kind of challenges. And I think the successful strategy, strategy should have several characteristics. One, certainly we know, agriculture should restore its historical production as the core, as the center. But we need to link the rural development, agricultural development, to the more broader rural economy. And we also need to have this framework to facilitate the transformation from agrarian-based economy to non-agrarian economy. That should be the characteristic of these strategies. And suddenly we now understand no one size fits all. You cannot have a policy or strategy that fits every country in different stages in different environment. So in that spirit, I'd just like to mention a framework. And uh, this time of the issue, can be used as a checklist, maybe incomplete checklist. Those are the areas that we need to consider. And this framework should cover agricultural policies, rural policies, and national policies. And in this framework, I think that it's very important to deal with the relation between the market, the private sectors, and the state. What are their appropriate? And for the agricultural policy framework, I think there are three areas. One certainly is increased, continuous increased productivity. The second one is to secure land tenure. And the third one is the access to finance. And increased agricultural productivity you certainly need to work through bringing new technology by INDs. <coughs> and bring the technology to the farmer by extension. And uh, to enable the farmer to use the technology, you need to have irrigation and uh, also modern inputs. And in this area, you know, I would say the state needs to play a very important role in agricultural research, in extension, and also in the provision of irrigation. Modern inputs, the market private sector can play more important. And then securing land tenure is important because it related to pharmacy incentive of production. It also related to pharmacy incentive for investment in infrastructure and uh, new technology and so on. And uh, securing land tenure is also important because, as I mentioned, economic development is a process of structural transformation. And only you have a secure land tenure, it will facilitate the consolidation of small farm household become biggest when you have all migration. And it also related to the incentive for all migration. If you have a secure use right or land right to land, when you want to all migrate, you can share those rights and uh, provide the means for all migration. So securing the land tenure is very important in those regards, and of finance. I think it's one difference between traditional agriculture and modern agriculture. Traditional agriculture, farmer use farm produce as input, right? But the modern agriculture, they need to purchase the seeds, they need to purchase the, 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 the modern inputs, and, and so you need to have access to finance to enable them to really you know, finance those kind of transactions. Those agricultural policy framework need to deal with. Then for the rural policy framework, I think we need to deal with agricultural product storage processing business. And they also need to deal with the issue of infrastructure including transportation and the telecommunication. And certainly it also has to deal with the issue of finance for agribusiness and so on. 
but you also need to have social dimension. Education, health, social safety. And the importance of agricultural storage, we know, because it's seasonal. And uh, it's also spatial. And so under that situation, you need to have storage to smooth the consumption and the market supply. And to increase the quality added, and you also need to have processing, you also need to have agribusiness. And transportation is very important. Without transportation, how can you reach national market or international market? And you also need to have the telecommunication so you know, you know what is demanded in the market and where is the shortage. And, and, and so you can grow your product to meet the demand. And uh, once you produce your demand, you can share to the prices for it needed. And the finance is also important not only for agricultural households, uh, but also for the agribusiness and so on. And in terms of finance, I'd like to say a few words because mostly in the low income country, agricultural households is small. A good business, small, medium size, but currently the financial model would not serve those kind of small scale agricultural household, small scale, medium scale, a good business, and so on. It's become a very important impediment for the rural development and agricultural development. For that, I think we may have to change our thinking about what is the appropriate financial structure for rural development, for agricultural development. And I strongly you know, advocate. Currently, we have some kind of by model. On the one hand, we have the big banks, equity markets, stock market. Those are good for big enterprises. And now we started to promote microfinance. It helps, but it's not enough for real purpose of modern agricultural production or agribusiness. I think we need to have some kind of small medium-sized local financial institutions, especially banks, to serve the needs of production, the needs of development, of agriculture, and uh, non-agriculture, agro-business, and so on. And then we need to have a national policy. For the national policy, the goal certainly is to put agriculture at the center for development, especially in a low-income country, but also need to facilitate the structural transformation, provide the coordination and to overcome externality in the process of this structural transformation. And certainly, the goal also need to provide the social safety net, education, social service, those kind of two urban areas, and especially also rural areas. And those are the goal of the national policies. But I like to say whether the government can play this kind of function very much depends on the development strategy adopted by the government. And I mentioned my Marshall Lectures in 2007. In that Marshall Lecture, I argue, you know, if the government follow the development strategies and under the old structuralism or institution strategies, and are trying to develop very capital intensive energy on an agrarian basis, capital scales, agrarian basis. Under the kind of situation, the industry promoted by the national strategies are not viable in uh, open competitive markets. And because they are not viable, the government need to introduce all kinds of distortions <coughs> to protect them. And with that kind of protection and so on, the policy will become what we observed in the 1960s, 1970s, urban bias, industrial bias. And the government, under the kind of situation, because they need to over mobilize all the resources to subsidize non viable enterprises. And the government will be deprived with the resources for the investment in infrastructure in the social safety, in the social se sectors and so on. That will be the result. And I think that we need to put more, some alternative new strategies, and that you know, in the papers or in my Marshall lectures, and also in my papers on new structural economics, and also in this growth identification and facilitation, I try to argue 
the government should, you know, follow strategies to facilitate the development of the economy according to their competitive advantages. And the government's role is to facilitate the industries or sectors with latent competitive advantages by providing the coordination in the infrastructure, in the education, or in the access to finance, and to compensate for the externality so they can turn the sector they have latent competitive advantages become their competitive advantages. That should be the national strategies. If they can do that, and the goal of put agriculture into the center of development, as well as all other dimensions I mentioned can be realized. Because we are low income country. In the early stage of development, agriculture certainly will be their competitive advantages, both in terms of resources, abundant, and also with their abundant labor force. But to realize those kind of competitive advantages, certainly they need to bring in new technologies to further facilitate their diversification from the grain based to agro business and so on. At the same time, if they can, at the beginning, start with agriculture, that's their competitive advantages, they can accumulate capital, human capital, and then they will have this kind of industrial upgrading and diversification move into the non agricultural sector. And in this process, the government need to play a facilitating role, and the state and the market certainly should also be the basic institution. Otherwise, you cannot identify which sectors you have competitive advantage or latent competitive advantages. If they can do that, the facilitation of government will not result in distortion, and their sectors will be competitive no matter it's in agriculture or non agriculture. And they can also achieve the macro stabilities. And the government will have more resources and a scope to make investment in the social dimension, education, health, and so on. So these are some kind of framework I have in mind. And I don't have any specific policy recommendation, but I hope it's a framework, a checklist. Now finally, let me share a few words about World Bank and agricultural development. I'd like to say World Bank's policies have been heavily influenced by the dominant thinking in academics. You know, from the 1950s to 1970s, it's a time of dominant thinking in development economics are two. One is old structuralism, emphasize the importance of commanding height to develop heavy industries, technological intensive industry. And the other one that are summarized in Ellen's Amherst lectures, that is classic development paradigm, treat agricultural growth as the engine for supporting industrialization. And then before the 1970s, I think World Bank were influenced by these two paradigms to dominate On the one hand, try to support and advise the developing country to develop heavy industries, capital intensive industries. And that certainly caused all kinds of distortion. But at the same time, World Bank also gave a lot of support to agriculture. And this is reflected in its allocation of funding. For example, IDA, the International Development Association you know, that's a low interest loan or grant to the developing country. In the 1970s, the IDA allocation on the average was about 42% of its total allocation funding. They're very crucial sectors. But because of failures of the old paradigms, especially the old structuralism, impulse substitution strategy, and so on, the dominating thinking, how time seek to the Washington, con Washington consensus. And we know the Washington consensus here, to, you know, focus on the macro stability, the getting price right, 
and then shift to the social sectors, education and health. And the sector development, no matter it is industrial sectors or agricultural sectors, were neglected. And a reflection of that was the allocation of funding to agriculture reduced dramatically. I mentioned that in the 1970s, 42% of the total allocation was earmarked for agriculture. In the 1990s, it reduced down to 23%. And then from 2000 to 2010, it further reduced down to only 9%. And uh, with the funding availability to agricultural development reduced dramatically, the World Bank research capacities, as well as the ability to provide advisory services, reduced significantly. I remember that when I did my summer intern at the World Bank in 1986, at that time, Agricultural Department, department was one of the largest departments in the World Bank. And it housed uh, group of leading researchers in the agricultural development. And they also provide a lot of funding for agricultural research. And I can see many of you actually were the collaborators at that time of the World Bank Agricultural Department. But now it's all reduced. It's all reduced. And this kind of reduction, attention to agricultural development was extremely harmful especially for the low-income agricultural-based economies in Africa, in other low-income countries. And as a result, the 2007 and 2008 food crisis, you know, it's not surprising because the migrants, migrants of agricultural development in the world and also in the world bank for so long, but luckily, there's some kind of reversal. I'd like to say that before the 2007-2008 food crisis, there was already some rethinking. And one evidence of this rethinking was 2008 World Development Report. Try to argue agriculture should be the centers of development effort in low-income countries. Agricultural development is the vehicle for achieving the NDGs, especially in terms of elimination of hunger, in terms of achieving the goal of reducing absolute poverty by half at the time of 2015. And also as a result of the 2008 food crisis, now the funding to agriculture rural development in the World Bank increased dramatically. Compared to 2008-2009, the finance increased 2.5 times, 2.5 times. But the constraint is that the analytical ability, the ability to provide an advisory service, it takes a long time to review. And so even funding increase, project increase, but this kind of analytic work is still continue to decline. It become a constraint. But I would say there's a new moment. One new moment is global donor communities. Now they recognize the central role of agriculture. And we know like Obama in the G20s meetings committed to provide 1 billion US dollars for supporting agricultural development in a low-income country. In other donor countries also have those kind of same incentives. And we also recognize it's very important not only provide the funding, equally important as the knowledge. And uh, you know, in last Wednesday, the president of the World Bank you know, gave a public speech on the direction for development research at the World Bank, and he challenged the world. He said, it's not only the research direction for the World Bank, it should be the research direction for the world. 
and he mentioned the four areas. One is structural transformation. The other one is broaden opportunity. The third one is coping with new risk. The last one is result orientation. And with, with this new framework, new research, I think a very important for the rural development is to come in with some kind of new strategy, new framework, as Alain argued in his Amherst lectures. We need to have some element of the classic development paradigms. That is agricultural for low income country should be as the core. But we need to learn from the past experiences. We need to put that into a structural transformation in a way that continuous transformation in a competitive way. And we also need to adopt new technology and in this new globalized world. I think that is a strategy, you know, in the spirit of what I lay out. But I think that it's just a starting point for these strategies to become a dominant thinking. And so to have an influence, impact on the World Bank operation, not only in given funding, but also in given analytical advice and so on. Not in the World Bank, but all in the international donor communities, as well as in our client's country, in our developing country. I think we need to join our effort, working together to promote more research, increase more understanding, and not only its logic, but also how to operate that, and continue to examine its impact, its result. And so we can further enhance our understanding. And I see that the conference in the last a day and a half is in the spirit. So let me conclude. I'd like to, again, thank Alain for your contribution and for organizing this conference. And I'd also like to thank all of you for your contribution in your career, but also in a conference in the last two days. Thank you very much. I use all my time. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way not to answer the question. <laughs> then, yeah. it's quite, of course, thank you for all you said. I really touched and uh, I was trying to avoid the subject, as you know. But co coming from you, uh, I take it as a great compliment. So thank you very much for what you said. I, I found it quite interesting that the, you would like to rebuild the capacity of the World Bank in the area of agriculture, not only in terms of research, but also in terms of the knowledge of the sector, the linkage within the sector, the, the broader economic policy, and in a sense the need to restaff the bank, not with the old staff, I think not like people like us, because the subject has changed, but with the new kind of people who will look at agriculture in the new way which has been looked at. Do you see, are you hopeful that this is going to happen? Uh, well, I'll try all the possibilities, certainly, one constraint is funding, and uh, the World Bank is facing, you know, has a policy, has a policy of flat budget. And uh, so, you know, with flat budget, how to reallocate is a challenging issue. But at the same time, we do try to mobilize resources from trust fund, from outside support. And also equally important is that we understand in this new world, especially in this multi-portal growth world, it's impossible for the World Bank to monopolize the research. So we need to build alliance. We need to outreach to academic centers of excellence like Berkeley and also in the developing countries. And the World Bank need to play some kind of you know, role for this kind of changes as a platform. Certainly, we need to have a critical mass of doing research, but the old models of 
making the World Bank as the center of the global research, I think those days has been gone. So we need to have a new, new model, new format. Yeah. Um, just a question on, uh, I'm very inter interested in your new view of the, of the role of the state, yeah. and the, the, the visible hand of the state, and I think that's a, that's a very interesting comment coming from the uh, chief economist of the World Bank. Um, but I guess one of the things we struggle with in the World Development Report, I think we are hinting at that right through the report, but then we've got the last section on, last chapter on governance. We really recognize the capacity problems, not only in the World Bank, but, but in governments themselves, and particularly in Ministries of Agriculture, but it's not just Ministries of Agriculture, because the Agriculture for Development agenda goes across many ministries, so just the coordination, uh, and then the capacity to really implement programs, and then along with that, in a more activist role, you get into all the other issues, not just the capacity, but rent-seeking, uh, picking winners, but really being losers, and so on. Uh, do you have do you have any uh, thoughts about where we can go? And, and, and I think we're all very frustrated at, at, at uh, this, this real uh, constraint that we face as we scale up uh, our investment programs. First, I respond to the question about capacity issue. And the second, to your question about picking winners. In terms of capacities, first, you know, if you look, now all the successful countries, you always credit them as with high capacities. But before they were so successful, you can see a lot of description how you know, bad their capacity were, how corrupt their country were. If you can read a lot of story about Korea, about you know the place where I was born, Taiwan, and 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 you see all those you know in the before 1960s, there's a lot of complaint about the government was so incapable, the government was so corrupted. It's you know all those discussion were very similar to the discussion about Africa or South Asia but they became successful. And now we say that they have a very high capacity. So there may be some indigeneity there, that's one thing. <laughs> and secondly, whether the capacity in Africa or in other low-income countries are so poor, I am doubtful. If they were able to implement those kind of input substitution strategies and we introduce all kind of distortion in order to support the commanding high. I think that those kind of things would be much harder to do than what we just try to do something to facilitate the development according to their competitive advantages. Because the distortion that required would be much smaller. What the facilitation or government intervention required would be much easier than those kind of all type of you know, import substitution strategies. Then, you know, so so I don't think that that the 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 the, the capacity is the main constraint. And uh, certainly, you need to start with something which, e.g., which is likely to have a quick win. And uh, if you can have those kind of things, then certainly they can build up their, you know, confidence and capacity. Just like we observe in, let's say, Korea in Taiwan, in all other successful countries. But then they come into the issue of how to pick the winners. Because I think the issue of picking is not you pick the winners. The issue of picking is that you always pick the losers. And but all the successful countries need to have a continuous stream of winners. Otherwise, how can they be <coughs> successful country? And that's the paper my paper of growth identification and facilitation hope to make a contribution. Fundamentally, I think the role of the government is to turn the latent compared advantages, to remove the constraint, and to provide the incentive, and to turn that into their compared advantages, right? And how do you identify the sectors which you are likely to have latent compared advantages? Well, they need to come 
compare, right? Compared to what it is compared. And so you identify countries which have similar environment structure as yours. But currently, their state of development is somewhat higher than yours. If their per capita income measured in purchasing power parities is about 100% or to 200% higher than yours, and you look into what they produced in the past 20 years, and those kind of sectors are likely to be your latent control advantages. And I say they are likely to be your latent control advantages is because, well, fundamentally your environment structure is similar, so the sector you're going to have compare advantage should be similar. And then if they are growing dynamically for the past 20 years, their wage rate must be double, triple, or even quadruple. And so what they produce in the past 20 years, because of increasing the wage rate, they should start to lose compare advantage in those areas. And since, they are, since your stage of development are not too far away from theirs, so you enter into those kind of sectors, you can use your low wages it's a competitive age, but certainly you need to overcome a series of coordination and externality issues. And that's what I try to you know, discuss in the papers. And in effect, that is what I observed historically. You know, because we can say, yes, 95% of industrial policy failed. But on the other hand, I can say all the successful countries, their development benefit from proactive government starting from Britain in the 15th, 16th century to Germany, France, US in the 19th century, early 20th century, and to Japan, to Korea, to Taiwan, and so on. I cannot find exception. And if you look, the successful country in general, in their government intervention target industries, in country, their per capita income was about 50%, 100% uh, higher than yours, than, than theirs. Like in the 14, 15th, 16th century, when Britain wanted to catch up NASA, at that time, their per capita income was about 75% of NASA that is per capita income. So they are not too far away. And they enter into the textile government, uh, textile industry, and so on. It's more technologically sophisticated, more capital intensive, both in human capital and, and also financial capital, and so on. But because the distance are not too far away. So with you know the other wages that they enter into that with the government facilitation they can be competitive. And in the late 19th century you find Germany, France, US wanted to catch up with Britain. They were successful was because their per capita income was about 60% to 75% of US per capita income. Similar policy was adopted according to Goshan Kwan. Similar policy, similar target was adopted by Russia, by Poland, by Hungary, or not successful. Because at that time, Poland, Hungary, Russia, their per capita income was much lower, only about 20, 30% of the Britain capital income. And so the range is too far. So they were not successful. In the 60s, 1960s, 70s, Japan also had active industrial policy, was successful. But at that time, their per capita income was about 40% of US per capita income already. So the industry they target were well, mature industry in the US, so they were successful. And similarly, East Asian economy, they were successful was because in the 60s, in the 70s, in, in the 80s, their targeted industry were Japanese industry instead of US. And we know that at that time, their per capita income was already about 40%, around 40% of Japanese per capita income. And if you look into other developing countries, how come their industrial policy fail? In general, they direct target the industry in the US. Like in China, you know, in the 1950s, 1960s, the goal of the nation was to uh, uh, overtake Britain in 15 years and to catch up US in 10 years. But the per capita income in China was only 5% of the US per capita income. <laughs> and the seminars, India had the same drive, and, uh, and, and, and Africa country had the same drive, even though their per capita income was only 5%. And so I, I think that you know, it's a very important question. And as I said, 
certainly we have no recipe which the government can 100% sure it's going to be successful. But if we can have a framework to help the country increase the probability of success, let's say from almost zero possibility to let's say 50%, 60%, 70% possibility of success, it would be a great contribution. Okay. This is fascinating. And thank you for this. On the targeting of sectors, when yeah. you say targeting, targeting of sectors, what specific public interventions are you talking about? R and D. You, you mentioned removal of constraints, and I understand yeah. that. Finance, yeah. protection, subsidy. Uh, well, it, in a country, you know, it? it's a framework. So, country in different stage of development, mm -hmm. the intervention will be different. For example, in a low income country. The sector you enter, in general, is mature sectors. Technology is mature. But for you to move into the new product, new sectors, it's innovation, right? Although the technology is mature. But it still is a new innovation. Innovation, you have the similar problem of all kind of risk. If even we try to move into the sectors are likely to be your latent compared advantage and turn that into compared advantages you have no 100% sure you're going to be successful. And so for the first mover, it can be a failure. And uh, the first mover need to pay all the costs. It can be a success. But if it's a success, and this sector is, is your competitive advantage, immediately one success will attract hundreds of thousands of entry. Competition comes. So the first mover will not have the monopoly rate. So you can see, for the first mover, no matter it's a success or it's a failure, you always provide externality to other people. But there are a symmetry between success and failure <coughs> in terms of cost and gain. So unless the government provides some kind of facilitation to overcome this kind of externality, then the incentive to be the first mover will be dramatically reduced, <coughs> not in a low-income country. But in a high-income country, certainly, for your continual you know, development, you need to you need to move into the new industry. New industry, because the high-income countries, they are already on the global technological frontier. Under the kind of new industries, where new technology comes from R&Ds. And we know in high-income countries, the government heavily been involved in the R&D, right? By export, patent, and also procurement, or mandate, exante, the support for basic research. And so the government laws is similar. But country in different stages, although in terms of innovations, the mechanism is the same and all require government facilitation, but the exact way of facilitation will be different. Yes, and I think you have time for one more question. So who you want me to answer? Uh, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. Um, yeah, Karen, yeah. she is my she is my <laughs> senior at the University yeah. of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, Karen, you have the last question. Well, that, that's well. First of all, thank you, Justin. It's very very interesting. That's a very weighty responsibility to take the last question, but I will ask it anyway. Your the role that you have sketched for the state it, as the facilitator of um, successful development, I think, does imply um, a capable civil service and. Um, well, I, I agree with you completely that there's a lot of capacity in even the, the poorest of developing countries. We often don't see that capacity in the public service, in the civil service, and so, and particularly in ministries of agriculture, we have challenges. Yeah. Um, I think the bank has not been particularly successful in working with civil service reform and in um, addressing that capacity issue, particularly within the civil service. Have you given some thought to the implications of where yeah. the bank should be putting its emphasis, given your thinking about the role of the state? Um, that's a good question, a challenging question. You know, coming from China, I always believe in some kind of dual track. It's impossible to improve the quality of the overall, overall, overall civil service. You cannot wait. And under the kind of situation, why not to do some kind of your trick in, in a way? Well, let's say we started with some kind of simple project, convince a few 
government officials and to start with those kind of intervention. And if it's successful, then the government will be encouraged to do more of that. And if it is successful in every country, you can always find young, you know, uh, inspire, uh, 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 you know, official to join that kind of effort. That might be the way to do it. So instead of trying to push an over, or, you know, overhaul of the whole system, you started with something that you can have a quick win, and they use those kind of demonstration effect to modify. That might be the approach that I'd like to try. And I started to do a little bit of that in some countries. Okay, well that concludes um, that session. I think we're going to take a 10, 15 minute break. Before we do that, I just want to let you know um, there is the dinner at 7 o'clock, and for those who need a ride, and there will be a bus taking you to the dinner. Um, why don't we, I think we need, we, um, Justin has done a wonderful job, and I think uh, we should give him a round of applause, and thank you very much, Justin, for coming. Okay.